Boridaro. Pronoun dar, every pony. This is Brony Dan. It's not original, but hey, you try coming up with reality these days. Well, it's 2016, folks, and this is Series 2 of Brony Dan. And I'm going to start things off by looking at a area of Friendship is Magic that I have completely overlooked. The comics. Now, admittedly, I was never an avid reader of the My Little Pony comics by IDW. Not from a lack of interest, but rather more of a lack of availability. There aren't many comic shops in my area, and in the ones that I could find, they didn't sell them. If I were to get an MLP comic, I'd have to wait until Comic-Con comes to Cardiff and search the stalls. Fortunately, even though I am unable to actually own a physical copy of a comic, there is actually a YouTube website that has actually managed to get every single issue on there, so that's where I'm going to be getting most of my sources. So, we're going to start things off by looking at the Micro Series. Yes, I am aware that the Micro Series was never the most popular of comic media. In fact, I've heard many people say it's downright terrible, while others say that it slowly got better once it had gotten the main six out of the way. So I've decided to pick one out at random, which just so happened to be the last issue in the series, My Little Pony Micro Series Issue 10. Yes, I mainly chose this because it's Princess Luna, so I will try not to be completely biased on it. The colour for this one is... odd. I guess it's trying to symbolise Luna's control of the night, what with having Celestia and Cadence asleep at the bottom, but why go with the gypsy motif? The alternative, however, is much more fit into the comic style of humour. I'm switching you to decaf. You know, if Luna were to ever actually get addicted to coffee or caffeine, I could imagine the night and day cycles lasting about a minute each. We open up with Luna talking with Celestia about her recent night events. At the gloaming, I ran off a manticore in the forest, then my guard and I scored the fjords for an owlbear that was terrorising the subjects. We also saw a few Norwegian blues that appeared to be pining for the fjords. Pining for the fjords? What kind of talk is that? Celestia makes a comment about how difficult her day is going to be, but Luna gets a bit snarky, saying that ruling the day is easy. No, really, I don't think you'll be prepared for the kind of day I have ahead of me. It really is a challenge to... Are you saying that your job is harder than mine? Well, considering how all the political debates that supposedly happen in Equestria take place during the daytime, whereas you spend most of your time fighting monsters at night... Yeah, I think you've got the harder job, Luna. And the most fun. Luna proclaims that she could handle the day as well, and Celestia decides to let her because, as Luna said, "'Twould be easy." Ah, twould. The ultimate closing argument statement. Celestia introduces Luna to her advisor, Kibitz, and tells him that Luna will be taking over the day shift. Kibitz explains the plan that she has for today, but Luna just seems to be more interested in having breakfast. Oh no, Princess. We are already three minutes behind schedule. I will have a bran biscuit sent along for you to eat as we walk to the watchtower. Um, well, I have a suggestion. Have a cereal bar. So Luna heads off to start the day with the morning survey of Equestria. Ponyville seems to be in fine health. Manhattan is abuzz with normality. Cloudsdale has not fallen from the sky. No threats are rising in this time. It's always amazing how she's able to see the entire length of Equestria from just that one little telescope. But while Luna wishes to continue to examine the goings-on in Equestria, Kibitz informs her that they need to attend the morning report from the guards in two minutes, and it's about as dull as a Star Wars prequel debate. And then we're gonna go through the Everfree Forest on patrol. We thought we saw a monster there yesterday. Oh, goody. Did you? Goodness, no. It was just an opossum. The gay Flash sentry over there quite the start, though. We're not even going to question why Flash is even with us, considering that he's a member of Princess Cadence's royal guard at the Crystal Empire and not Cantalots, but really he's only here just so that we can show the fans that even we think he's a joke. Also, I think that guard may be a mare. Those eyelashes are looking quite feminine. Oh, and speaking of possums, you've probably noticed the possum that's appearing throughout this story. This is Luna's pet possum, Tiberius. There is a mini-story that explains how she got him, but it has no relevance to this one. 
Tiberius' main purpose throughout this whole thing is just so he can look cute. And we are all waiting for the day for him to actually appear in the show. Meanwhile, a shadowy figure darts through the back alleys of Canterlot and arrives at a shady establishment. Actually, it's just Princess Celestia arriving at a spa. Princess Celestia, it's been so long since we've seen you. We haven't seen you since you introduced all those spending cuts that force us to close you down and be relocated to this dingy rat-infested street. Meanwhile, Luna is attending a meeting about social event number 213. And much like the reader, she is happy when it's all over, because now it's time for disputes. And the first one is between the Flim Flam brothers and those hippies from issue 3 of the micro series over who owns a cart. However, Luna, it appears, is a fan of the King Solomon method of democracy. We shall cut the cart in half. Both parties shall receive a half and be happy. Hey, as long as this doesn't become her chosen method, I'm sure everything will be... The same reasoning applies. We shall cut the sheep. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Luna, don't cut up the sheep. North Wales will be devastated. Oh, and apparently it's now only nine o'clock in the morning. Who the hell has planned business meetings and public interactions before nine? I don't usually get up until 8, and on some days I don't even bother getting dressed until after 11. Actu actually, it's 9.07. We're seven minutes later than I'd like us to be. Oh dear, Princess Celestia would never be this far behind schedule. We must make up the time. Oh, what would she do if she knew we were behind on our docket? Well, knowing Celestia, she probably wouldn't give a shit. In fact, she's pretty much enjoying not having responsibilities while Luna suffers through kissing babies. Not as creepy as I'm making it sound. In fact, when the hell did that trait even start? I have never seen that happen in reality. Cutting ribbons and taking care of the pets? What? Why does Celestia have corgis? She's not the fucking Queen of England. So Luna is beginning to feel the weight of Celestia's responsibilities, and Kippet isn't quite so sympathetic. You do realize I'm normally asleep right now, don't you? Oh, Piffle! You fell asleep for four whole minutes during our presentation of the award for best attendance at the School of Gifted Unicorns. That should be enough pep to get you through the rest of the afternoon. I can hurt you. I'm sure you could, but if you do, you'll never get your lunch. Well, actually, I could. I could snap your neck, teleport to the kitchen, and be back with a sandwich in ten seconds. Easy. But surprisingly, Kibitz does try to support Luna when she starts to have doubts. Buck up, Princess. You told your sister that you could handle all this. She would never have let you try if she didn't think you could do it. I'm sure she's skulking about the castle, smiling from the shadows at what a good job you're doing. No, she isn't. But, you know, thank you, kid. Bits. Maybe you're not such a stick in the... And if you can't handle it, I'm sure your sister is in the shadows ready to step back into her duties. Prick. But the next thing on the list is actually something that does excite Luna, mingling with the ponies in the Cantalock Garden. Because let's face it, she's the only one who's actually had that experience. However, Kibitz leaves Luna alone in order to retrieve a highlighter pen, which gives her a chance to strike a conversation with Cantalot's only non-douche fancy pants. He mentions that he enjoys a game of chess, so Luna decides to play. However, since they don't have a board with them, she decides to improvise, which is to use the guests as chess pieces on a grass-cut board. I could not make this shit up if I tried. But alas, Kip Buzzkill returns and scorns Luna for her actions and drags her away for another meeting with delegates for the Crystal Empire. Does that mean we can move now? No, I think we should all wait until she comes back. Ah, uh, but what if one of us needs the bathroom? Well, I'm sure you can hold it in. Well, I'm actually going right now on the grass. I suppose talks of dancing and fire will be interesting. This would be the first step for Princess Luna into arson. I may not be wrong, as these panels show that as the talk goes on, Luna starts to slowly lose it, especially over the fact that she has to review the opening ceremonies all at the same time. And so we get this two-page spread of madness and chaos. There are some nice little Easter eggs in this, like photo finish, vinyl scratch, and a... a car? There are cars in Equestria? 
In a world of talking equines that possess magical abilities and flight with mythical creatures everywhere, I find this to be the most unbelievable thing. Well, finally, Luna snaps at this, stuffs the list down Cupid's throat not enough to choke him, and proclaims that they are going to do things her way now, which is really just her going around and talking to ponies about their problems. So at last, Celestia returns, and Luna, gracefully, begs her sister to take her position back, which she does, and like a troll, she decides to go to bed, leaving Luna to deal with another 12 hours of duty, while the Cantalot elite are still outside waiting for Luna to return. They may be a while. This comic is actually quite good. I'm not just saying that because I'm a fan of Luna, but what makes it work is really Luna and the comedy around her. She keeps a little bit of her season 2 persona speaking in Old English, so the dialogue does come out as humorous. Kibitz is certainly an interesting foil for Luna as he tries to keep balance and order with someone who's really out of touch with modern society, the artwork helps with the comedy and is also quite cute as well. This will probably be the closest we'll ever get to having an episode with just the Royal Sisters, but if it does, then I'm not going to complain. This is Brony Dan saying... Nosta. Anything you can be, I can be greater. Sooner or later, I'm greater than you. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Yes, I am.